Thank you. Well, I'd, I'd like to thank the rector very much for that extremely uh, detailed and, and generous introduction. But I'd particularly like to thank all of you and I unfortunately can't see a single face, but I know you're there, uh, to thank you all for coming here. It's very moving to me to see a public culture that values dialogue in the way that this one does. And, uh, you know, it isn't that way all over the world. And it makes me very happy to be here in, in Belgium and uh, to join with you in discussion. So I'm gonna talk about the new book for maybe half hour, 35 minutes, and then we'll move to a, a dialogical format, and then I hope that meanwhile you'll be thinking of questions and that uh, then, then we can have more of an exchange. So how can a decent society, one that has basically good political principles and firm aspirations to realizing them, remain stable in a world dominated by greed, anxiety, and self-interest. That's the problem that I address in the book. Now, I'm basically imagining the society as the one that I argue for in, in the other books that the director mentioned that is based on the aim to extend to all human beings not only equal respect, but a basic threshold level of all these different capabilities that require redistribution of resources from rich to poor. And uh, so, so the question I was asking myself is, how to bring together that aspirational political work about justice with the work that I had done on emotions? And my, my claim in the book is that there's a need to cultivate public emotions of extended sympathy and mutual love if good political principles are to come into being and to remain stable. We all come into the world, unfortunately, as rather narrow and selfish creatures. We know now from psychological research that like other primates, human beings are narrow. And it's easy for us to love the ones we're close to and not to care about the ones that are far away. So there's a problem. How do we get people to care about the ones they don't know and to care in a way that supports sacrifice, often, of their financial and material self-interest? Uh, but there's also another problem, which is very basic to the book all the way through, and that is how to cultivate public emotion in a way that activates and doesn't negate the critical spirit, the spirit of dissent, which is a very important part of what keeps any democratic culture alive. Now, most people are very suspicious of the role that emotions play in politics because we can all think of the bad things that it's done, and I, I think that's true particularly in Europe where the example of fascism immediately comes to mind. And so people think that emotions are bound to be forces that go only in one direction in the direction of bad political action and unthinking, uncritical thought. But let's stop and think again, and this is what I try to do in the book. Good principles, too, do not persist and remain stable just because they're written as words on paper. People are only going to be willing to pay taxes that support the well-being of others if they do care for those others. And so any ambitious project of redistribution will require thinking about how people will come to care about the ones that they don't know. Again, any society has suspicion, fear of foreigners, fear of other racial groups, and that fear, and sometimes disgust as well, often disables equal respect and provides a very powerful impediment to getting along well with one another in society. So emotions have to be managed somehow. How do we get people to think about the others without this fear and disgust? So, so my claim is that we really need to devote thought to the good side, the good role emotions can play, and not just think we can wash our hands of them completely, because they're there, they're in us, and they can go to the good or they can go to the bad. But we won't get anything good that requires effort and sacrifice without them. So in part one of the book, I study a long tradition in political philosophy after the French Revolution that reflects on the need for a public culture of emotion. The most 
The earliest and most famous such example is Jean-Jacques Rousseau's chapter on the civil religion at the end of the social contract, where Rousseau rightly argues that society does need sentiments of some kind of solidarity that make people feel like they're fellows of one another. But then, you know, to my mind, he goes very badly astray in thinking that these emotions must be homogeneous, dictatorially imposed, and people who dissent are going to be punished, and so on. So that's the neglect of the critical spirit that's the worry that persists throughout my book. But I then examine another group of figures who are more congenial to me, Mazzini, the great Italian patriot who thought there could be, a, he thought that we needed patriotism because people are selfish and with the advent of capitalism, they're all the more selfish. So we need to cultivate a kind of patriotism that can call people away from their self-interested projects to attend to the good of everyone in the nation. And he thought we couldn't do it for the whole world all at once. The sentiment of common humanity was too abstract and too thin, but an idea of the nation that's grounded in geography and history could have enough force and depth to summon people away from self-interest. I also talk about John Stuart Mill, who of course is famous for his defense of political liberty, which is very, very important and which I endorse, and a defense of the spirit of what he called experiments in living. But he also believed that it was extremely important for people to learn that they weren't just all out for their own personal utility, but they should be supporting the general utility. So in an extremely important paragraph in his work, Utilitarianism, he says, well, there's this funny split between personal utility and general utility, and how do we cross over that gap? We have to do it through an education of the emotions. And, uh, well, he goes on in a different book that he wrote about Auguste Comte to say that can't be done in a dictatorial way. It must be done with a spirit of critique, very vigorously alive, and with institutions that protect political liberty. But he did think that there was a kind of emotional education that people needed to have that made them willing to see their fate in everyone else's to some degree and to feel emotions of sympathy for, let's say, poor people whom they didn't actually know. So he's one that I follow, and then another one that, who's particularly important to me, and a lot of my work has been in India, was the great Indian philosopher and educator Rabindranath Tagore, who comes closer perhaps than any other thinker to the spirit of my project. Now Tagore thought that, again, that people are selfish, but they are also capable of very deep and powerful love. And this love has its roots in the family, in the child's intense love of parents and the parents' love for their children. But what we need to do to form a nation, because he was one of the architects of the Indian nation, was to summon that love outward without losing its poetic individuality and its poetic force. So he thought, really, education has to be poetic. It has to use the force of all the arts. But what's important about Tagore is that he actually did create a school and a university that put this into practice. And uh, my economist colleague Amartya Sen grew up in that school, but his mother, Amita Sen, was one of Tagore's leading dancers. And Tagore thought that by teaching people to learn these emotions of fellowship and fellow citizenship with their bodies, through dance, through music, you could give them a very powerful step toward being citizens of a future democracy, which didn't yet exist. And so Amita Sen wrote a very fine book about Tagore as a dancer and a choreographer that talked about how he put these ideas into practice. But very importantly, once again, like John Stuart Mill, Tagore thought you must do this in a way that preserves the space for improvisation and critique. But not only that, but you must teach people actually to love the spirit of critique. So he wrote a lot of songs, and in fact, two of Tagore's songs are the national anthems of India and of Bangladesh. So he's the only composer that's written two national anthems. But, and they stress sentiments of equal respect and other very powerful things and put 
puts that into seductive and moving music. But another song that he wrote became the linchpin of Gandhi's independence movement. So imagine now we have close to a million people marching along with Gandhi to the sea to illegally defy the British salt tax by making salt from the seawater. And they're singing a song. Now this is a song written by Tagore. And you might think it's a million people marching together. So they're gonna be singing a song about togetherness. But no, the song Gandhi wanted them to sing, which was written by Tagore, was, if no one answers your call, walk on alone, walk alone, walk alone. And then the last verse of this very beautiful song, which I will not try to sing because it's difficult to sing in that style and my voice is trained in a very different style. But, um, but anyway, it's, um, no, because you have to sing without vibrato, and it, it's very hard to do that if you're used to singing with vibrato. But anyway, um, in the last verse he says, if no one shows a light on your path, then striking light from your own ribs, go on burning alone. So imagine that very powerful, deeply moving image that the person uses their own body, the, the ribs in their own rib cage, to strike, like with a flint, the spark which will illuminate their path. So that's a poetic, an eroticization, an emotionalization of the spirit of dissent and critique, which he thought should animate every single person in that group of one million future citizens of the Indian nation. And I, I really do think that it's the spirit, whatever the problems of the nation are, and there are many, that makes this a democracy and a thriving one where there is plenty of dissent and critique, not just solidarity. So, so that's the historical part of the book. I then turn to, as the rector briefly mentioned, resources and problems. Because by now we know a lot more about human psychology than Mill or even Tagore knew. They thought, and, and particularly Mill, that the main uh, resource we have is compassion and that the main problem we have is that it's too narrow. So they imagined the task in rather simple terms. Let's just get compassion, which is usually directed at a small group, to direct itself to a larger and larger group. Now I think there's truth to that, but I actually think we need to go deeper into the roots of compassion, and I argue in part two that we need to think not just about compassion, but its roots in love, in the love that people learn in the family, and the very profound gratitude that people learn to have to their parents for caring for them, and that this can grow outward and become gratitude to the political principles that sustain us and give us the equal respect that we hope we will cherish and perpetuate. Uh, so those are the resources, but there are also problems. And I think the 19th century people were so optimistic about human progress that they neglected the darker side of human psychology. And so I spend some time talking about the tendency to social hierarchies, which I believe to be animated in large part by a very deep discomfort that human beings find themselves facing about their own bodies. The fact that we are mortal, that we are helpless, that we are frail, shows up in the fact that we, unlike every other animal, we're uncomfortable with our own bodily functions. We are uncomfortable with our excretion, with our urination, with our blood, with our sexuality, and we have this a kind of disgust at the waste products that our body itself puts out. Now that's difficult enough, and I think it prepares us very badly for aging and medical crises and so on. Uh, but worse yet, in every society that we know, people take that disgust which they have toward their own waste products and they project it onto some group in the society. It might be the lower castes in the Indian caste hierarchy. It might be African-Americans in my own uh, country in its terrible history of racism. 
it might also be gays and lesbians in the way that uh, I've written a lot about how pamphlets that tried to whip up hatred of gays and lesbians focus on bodily disgust and they try to make people feel disgust toward the sexual practices of gays and lesbians. So there is this disgust and which groups it targets may vary from country to country and time to time. In fact, women often come in for quite a lot of it and a lot of misogyny is based on the thought that women are kind of hyper animal and hyper bodily and somehow disgusting. But this disgust is ubiquitous and it's a powerful problem. So all good societies have to think about ways of managing and limiting the role played by disgust. So, so that's part two, the, as it were, resources and problems. But then how do we go further? Now I then have part three, of course, and part three is a series of historical essays because what I think, and I think it's true of any country, is that any good proposal for the cultivation of public emotion will be adequate only if it's not just experimental, but highly contextual. What moves people is a function of their sense of their nation's history, its traditions, its current problems, in short, Mazzini was right. The abstract sense of humanity is too thin. What moves people is, is much more concrete. So leaders attempting to generate emotional support for valuable projects must engage with people as they are, with their particular historically shaped loves and cares, even if ultimately what they want to do is to lead them to a new place. So if we want to see what could be done well today, we need to study carefully what has been well done in the past in the way, for example, that Martin Luther King Jr. trying to think about how to move people emotionally to support the civil rights movement studied Mohandas Gandhi very, very deeply, but of course he didn't imitate him. I mean, if Martin Luther King Jr. had shown up wearing a loincloth and carrying a walking stick and being portraying himself as an ascetic, that would have really been pointless and ludicrous even. He had to fashion himself as a kind of person, in this case a Christian preacher, who could powerfully move Americans. And he had to use a kind of rhetoric. He wouldn't sing the songs of Tagore, but he would instead refer to the Bible, to Shakespeare, to texts which move Americans because they're deep in their, in their guts. So a good public emotions do embody general principles, but they clothe them in the garb of history. So in the book, I look at different areas of emotional difficulty in modern societies, fear, shame, disgust, and so on. And I look at different kinds of patriotism, but I focus all, all the way on two specific nations, just because I think you have to know what's happened in the historical context. And that is the United States and India, both nations that I've spent a lot of time in and on and studied in depth. Um, but I think we can also do more than just enumerate examples of what has gone well. Public emotions must deal with a wide range of different themes and problems, but it's possible to offer a kind of semi-organized, semi-theorized account of how certain areas of life that come up in all societies might be well addressed before we illustrate that account with concrete cases that I then discuss in detail. So, um, as I say, all societies have to manage in particular two powerful sorts of emotions, compassion and the love that underlies it, and on the other hand, disgust, which threatens equality. Compassion and love need to be extended from their narrow roots so that they will support projects of social redistribution in the name of the common good. Disgust needs to be limited and opposed, lest it become an impediment to general concern. So all societies, I would say, need something like the spirit of tragedy, and the spirit of comedy. The spirit of tragedy shapes compassion and the sense of what goes wrong when people are deprived of the things they need. The spirit of comedy indicates ways to rise above bodily disgust in a spirit of physical delight. 
The ancient Greek tragic and comic dramas, of course, were in a very different kind of society, but I think they do contain a lot of insight about how this might be done. So if one starts from that case, and from what all the philosophers of antiquity wrote about that case, it gives a kind of starting point to situate and examine contemporary uh, cases. So to make a very dogmatic assertion, a central function of the ancient Greek tragic festivals was to educate compassion, cultivating emotional awareness of shared human possibilities rooted in our bodily vulnerability, things that can go wrong to good people. So the performances were occasions for very deep emotion. We have tales of intense emotional reactions on the part of the audience, including women giving birth because they were so shocked by the scenes of grief. But these emotions were not considered antithetical to the idea of a democracy based upon deliberation and argument. In fact, just the opposite. They were considered important inputs for political discussion. And often this input was very critical, as when Euripides' Trojan Women invites its audience to feel intense compassion for women who were made slaves and raped in wartime, but then turns that into an argument against current imperialist projects of the Athenian democracy. As for Greek comedy, the comedies of Aristophanes, one of the central roles of Greek comedy was to promote reconciliation through laughing delight with the fluids and the indignities of the human body. As in tragedy, the body is seen as a site of great vulnerability Many of the jokes in Aristophanes turn on the way an ambitious plan is derailed by the need to defecate at an, op an inopportune moment or an unwelcome sexual erection. But the vulnerability is embraced as common to all, as just part of being human and alive and connected to life's joy. And the comedies celebrate that fragile joy while repudiating the all too common pretense that one doesn't really have a body and one is invulnerable. As readers of Aristophanes are often shocked to notice, comedy deals with matters that are sometimes found disgusting. But the plays actually do not court disgust, they banish it. They ask us to forget about that disgust stuff. The undermining of disgust is closely linked to civic deliberation and to projects of reconciliation between previously antithetical groups, as when at the end of the Lysistrata, the Athenians and the Spartans are suddenly reconciled in the middle of the Peloponnesian War. And they're reconciled in a dance in which Lysistrata tells them to hold on to the penises of the, the men to form their dancing circle. And so it's like through the, through the, the actions of the body that the, the reconciliation takes place. So, large modern nations obviously can't do what the Greeks did because they can't have a holiday where they ask everyone to come into one place and stop all work and just think and react and have emotions for several days. But they can try to understand what the tragic festivals and the comic festivals did politically and find their own analogs using many different techniques. And in the book I discuss political rhetoric, publicly sponsored works of visual art and sculpture, the design of memorials for national tragedies, the design of public parks and public holidays and celebrations. So now I'm just gonna briefly give you two cases on the tragic side and one on the comic side from the US in which I think the uh, kind of tragic and comic spectatorship that I have in mind was cultivated in a way, once again, that invites and does not seal off the spirit of individuality and critique. So first, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his use of the arts in drumming up support for the New Deal. Now, as you may well know, the United States has never fully accepted the idea of social and economic entitlements, at least it's a fragile idea in American terms, to accept the idea that we need a social safety net at all. During the Depression, when many people were suffering greatly, Roosevelt had to inspire a fellow feeling for those people who were suffering, and he had to get it over the very common American reaction that it's their fault, that the poor cause their own poverty. Compassion requires three parts. It requires 
and Aristotle already said this, the thought that the suffering is very serious, the thought that you didn't cause it by your own fault, and the thought that in some way we all have similar possibilities, that we're all, all in this life of chance together. Well, to mobilize support for the New Deal, for social security, for all the parts of the social safety net that are still, some of them still exist and some are under attack, well, he had a complex task. He also had a lot of artists who were out of work in the Depression, so he had people that he could put to work. And uh, so he put them to work trying to drum up and inspire fellow feeling for the pre people who had lost their livelihood during the Depression. And they had to get people to sacrifice because all Americans were gonna have to pay a lot more tax. The income tax was itself relatively new at that time. And so, you know, he had to get them to sacrifice for the sake of these people. Now Roosevelt, understanding where people were coming from, deliberately set out to convince Americans that an economic disaster has all the features of a tragic natural disaster. In other words, the, the very phrase, the depression, suggests, of course, what the name implies, a storm, a tropical depression. And it, but the, so the economic crisis was like a, a big storm that hit people. Winning compassion for the victims of economic disaster required convincing the American public that the calamity was serious and, and that was not too hard, but that the people were not to blame for it any more than they would be to blame for being the victims of a hurricane or an earthquake. And therefore that it was the sort of thing that any human being might suffer, that we're all in this together. So let's just talk about how he used ph photography, which was then an art that was the most popular art, so you could, you could reach most broadly. So hiring a staff of very talented photographers, including Dorothea Lange, Walker Evans, and many others, the administration gave them specific instructions about who and what to photograph. It also chose later which photographs would be widely circulated and which ones wouldn't be. And those that were selected were shipped to newspapers and magazines all around the country, included in reports given to Congress and displayed at conventions of social workers so that the images rapidly came to stand for the depression itself and for the social security measures that were being fought for. So how did these images extend the compassion of a skeptical American public? The seriousness of the plight of the poor was the easiest thing to depict. Images showing lines of people waiting for bread, you know, various kinds of relief, uh, soup kitchens and so on, made vivid the lack of basic necessities in lives that were hit hard by the depression. The magnitude of the reversal was also evident in the clothing of some of the applicants. So it was a very like Greek tragedy where a character will say, I used to be a king and now look what happened to me. You could see that people had sometimes middle-class clothes, but they were very worn and now very dirty. Other images showed people thin who were you know, clearly malnourished, and they were trying to nourish their children. There's one particular famous one, which you can look up on the internet, Dorothea Lange, a photograph of a, of a mother trying to nurse her baby, but it's clear that both are suffering from hunger. More difficult to construct were the other elements of compassion. Lack of blame and the idea of similar possibilities, of course, go closely together, but it has to be made clear that the cause of the misery is not laziness and it's not badness on the part of the poor. Roosevelt's agents thought about this problem very hard and we have a lot of information about what they said. So first of all, they banished all photographs of labor agitation which might be potentially violent and which are scary to Americans. I mean, we've never had a very powerful labor movement since uh, he didn't want to put people off by fear and make of them think of the poor as threats or troublemakers who brought their misery on themselves. Instead, he preferred images of people with great dignity queuing up for basic necessities or trying to go about their daily tasks like feeding their children. Second, the images that he chose were shorn of biography. I mean, here he really did learn from the Greek tragedians, where there, in a way there's an individual, but it's so 
shorn of specificity and particularity, that it can stand for many. Because we didn't want to think that individual moral character caused this person to be poor. And you can't even really ask those questions when you see these very powerful and archetypical photos. The only cause of misery that we're permitted to focus on when we look at these photos is the depression itself. Since the ones in the ones that were selected, the viewer is prevented from identifying the people as individuals by hats that shadow the face, by shadows around the people, and by a kind of hazy focus that obscure d details of physiognomy. It's almost like the mask of the tragic hero, really. These are people that are made equal in loss. Other photographs of suffering have a surface clarity like the Dorothea Langham mother. I mean, so you do see her particular face. But at the same time, she's clearly a kind of archetype, almost like a, a, a religious image of the Madonna. So we don't get asking questions about who is she and what is her particular story. Vivid pictures of babies being nursed by migrant women uh, are, are particularly common in the whole set of photos. Roosevelt's appeal to emotion through a carefully crafted use of the arts was a very important feature in the success of New Deal programs. Now, of course, people could criticize them, and they did. Institutions of the protection of free speech, I think, are an extremely important part of any political culture that uses such emotional manip manipulation. But he did it. I mean, he went out on a limb and tried to really get people to care about these other people. And I think the fact that no one is really doing that in America today, uh, and, and of course Reagan did exactly the opposite. He got people all to be moved by themselves and by self-interest and, and took things in the opposite direction is a good part of the explanation for why the social safety net is falling apart. Now, I want to turn to a different case that's politically much more complicated. Of course, the, the first one contained tragedy, but it was politically pretty simple because the values are in some way win general approval, and even though there's difficulty and struggle, citizens are not really um, ultimately going to disagree that people need food to live and so on. But this one I'm going to turn to is the Vietnam War, which is a place where Americans were so deeply divided that as I was in university, the country was really uh, riven in two, uh, greatest division since the Civil War. So public art would be extremely suspect if it had a unanimous and kind of rah-rah view about the Vietnam War. And there's a task to be achieved. It's both to mourn and to rec promote reconciliation of a deeply divided nation. So the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is what I now want to talk about. There was a competition held to design a memorial for those who died in the Vietnam War. So monuments, monuments are reminders of enduring aspirations, but memorials, in addition, are reminders of pain and painful loss. Uh, as my friend, the late Arthur Danto, a wonderful philosopher, put it, we erect monuments so that we shall always remember and build memorials so that we shall never forget. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial is one of these complex memorials. It's situated on the mall in Washington between the Washington Monument, which I'll say something about in a minute, and the Lincoln Memorial. So it's pointing because it's got walls that are hinged at a 125 degree angle. So the wings point, one to the Washington Monument, one to the Lincoln Memorial, so one to the nation's highest aspirations, one to its most painful loss. The Washington Monument, if you've ever seen it, it doesn't matter. It's an obelisk. It's very high. It expresses aspiration. It's abstract, impersonal, and aspirational. And it's regular. It's the same on all sides. Nonetheless, unlike classical obelisks, it's actually not a monolith. It's composed of separate blocks. So it expresses also the unity of the originally disunited 13 colonies. But um, so it symbolizes unity and aspiration. And with its graceful white ascent, the high goals of that union and its enlightenment pedigree, because it's a, the obelisk was connected to Washington's Masonic uh, affiliation. 
Deliberately and against counter proposals, it's utterly abstract and impersonal. It, um, some people were saying you should have Washington on a horse and all, but they rejected the personal portrait in favor of abstract aspiration, and it's very successful. The Lincoln Memorial, by contrast, shows Lincoln, the individual, but in a way that, again, was quite controversial at the time. He's bowed down by suffering. He's crushed by the terrible sadness and the burden of the Civil War. So the Vietnam Veterans Memorial then points both to the nation's highest hopes and to its most profound loss. The competition to design the memorial was explicit in its constraints. It said the memorial has to first be reflective and contemplative in character. It must be harmonious with its site and surroundings, and it must provide for the inscription of the names of every single American, nearly 58,000, who lost their lives or remained missing. It must make no political statement about the war, and it must occupy two acres of land. So that, those were the constraints. Many subsequent objections to the design were really objections to the criteria for the whole competition. The unanimous choice was a design by a very young woman, 21-year-old woman of Asian American origin named Maya Lin from Athens, Ohio, who was at that time a student at Yale University. Initially, her design was very controversial. Some veterans groups saw these black granite walls as a wall of shame, a degrading ditch, a wailing wall for liberals. These were the things that were said. And many were indignant at the absence of any typical representation of soldiers and their nobility. As a result of that, a banal bronze statue of four soldiers by Frederick Hart was later added opposite the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. But in only a short time, the Veterans Memorial became immensely popular, and it remains, I think, probably America's most popular work of public art. The simple dignity of the design, which I'll describe in a minute, it's straightforward and unpretentious mourning for the individual lives lost in the war, the people in it, and so on. Um, it all draws people in, and it's one of the most visited works, and the only one on the mall that's actually interactive and a living memorial where people are putting up photographs and flowers next to particular names. They're asking for ladders so they can make rubbings of the name of the one they lost and so on. And all of this is in accordance with Maya Lin's plan. She said she intended the memorial, quote, to bring out in people the realization of loss and a cathartic healing process. So, so it really is a tragic festival, only you move and the memorial stands still. She drew particular attention to the contemplative and personal character of the memorial. Uh, she, she wrote, quote, brought to a sharp awareness of such a loss, it is up to each individual to resolve or come to terms with the loss. For death is in the end a personal and private matter, and the area contained within this memorial is a quiet place meant for personal reflection and private reckoning. The memorial can't be seen at all from a distance. That's one of its interesting features. You can't interact with it casually without entering its space. Nor can you use it casually. You, you can play frisbee on other parts of the mall, but you, once you're in the memorial, you're in, because you enter it almost like a solemn ritual space by walking downhill. It opens like a gash in the earth. As you walk, you feel like you're in the valley of the shadow of death. And yet the space is also not tomb-like. It's not enclosed. The sky is still visible. The memorial, as I say, consists of these two slabs, huge slabs of black polished granite hinged at the center like a book. It's really the book of the dead. The names are in chronological order and they both begin and end at the center where the book is hinged. There's no other symbol, there's no flag, no message, only the names of individuals. So the contrast to the Washington Monument is stark. I mean, that's completely abstract, no individuals. This is only, only the individual is real. But there's something else. As you study the names, you see your own face behind them. It was part of Lynn's plan that the stone is highly reflectant. So what you see is the names of the dead, and at the same time, 
yourself hovering indistinctly behind the names. So the work in this way becomes interrogative and Socratic. It poses a question about your own relationship to the war. Were you there? Did you lose a loved one? What do you think of all this loss? Was it worth what the war accomplished, if anything? So the monument is, uh, is contemplative, but it is also Socratic. It, it presses very uncomfortable questions. Uh, the process of questioning, however, operates not through straightforward Socratic argument, but through emotions of grief and loss. Arthur Danto, who was not just a philosopher, but a powerful art critic, wrote um, when the memorial first opened, quote, be prepared to weep. Tears are the universal experience, even if you don't know any of the dead, end quote. And when you observe the names, another reason that you weep is you see families there putting the flowers, putting the photos by the name of the one they lost. So in that way, the memorial, while it's about individuals, also, like the tragic festivals, attains a kind of universality. It includes everyone in the experience of loss and binds people together, no matter whether they opposed the war or they supported the war. And so that's why it quickly became popular. It does promote healing of the divisions that were caused by the war by bringing people together in a contemplative and emotional space. The idea that it represents shame was quickly just dispelled by people's shared perception that it dignifies the individual fallen soldiers and their sacrifice, making their fate a matter of national concern. So I would say that this is an Athenian tragic festival. By summoning powerful emotions and at the same time getting people to pose questions about the events that are connected to those emotions, it gets people to examine their own lives and our shared life, past and present, in a way that people usually don't do amid the distractions of daily life. Now I turn for my last example to comedy. Well, Aristophanes seems more remote, maybe, from contemporary life than Sophocles because good humor is typically very local and um, national and contextual. So it might seem odd to imagine any modern analog of the comic festivals, but I think that, that spirit of reconnecting to the body, celebrating the body, and banishing disgust uh, does uh, also survive. And I'll give you just one example, and it's right up here on, on the cover of the book, so we'll talk about that. Now, Millennium Park is in the middle of downtown Chicago, and uh, cities, of course, have many opportunities to bring people together because they're spatially limited. So I want to talk about Millennium Park, which opened in 2004, and it creates a unique kind of public space. Now, Chicago long had been associated by other people with bodily smells, bodily fluids, things that East Coast people found undignified, and Carl Sandburg, a very fine poet who loved Chicago, celebrated the bodily diversity in a famous poem called Chicago, where he, which begins, hog butcher for the world, tool maker, stacker of wheat, player with railroads and the nation's freight handler, stormy, husky, brawling, city of the big shoulders, laughing the stormy, husky, brawling laughter of youth, Half naked, sweating, proud to be hog butcher, tool maker, stacker of wheat, player with railroads, and freight handler to the nation. So, so Chicago was seen that way, and by Sandberg with poetic delight, but by others with a kind of condescension and disdain. As the journalist H.L. Mencken famously wrote, I give you Chicago. It is not London and Harvard. It is not Paris. It is American in every chitling and spare rib. It is alive from snout to tail. So that was you know, the East Coast guy looking down at the body. Now, not all Chicagoans liked being looked down at that way. So the first history of public space and public parks in Chicago was an attempt to flee from the body and to deny that Chicago <laughs> in a way had a body. And so Grant Park, which was built in imitation of the formal gardens of Europe, has as its centerpiece, 1927, Buckingham Fountain, which is white and pure, and it's totally humanly inaccessible 
No one uses it, no one goes there. If people feel uncomfortable in that space because it's too kind of garden-like and too, too formal. And uh, so, so really it's no wonder that people don't go there because it doesn't want real people in. And once they're there, there's nothing for them to do. When Chicago welcomed the world during the Columbian Exposition of 1892, it chose to portray itself as pure white. And uh, the temporary buildings of that exposition, which are actually, some of them remain, and they're right, right near my university, they were known as the White City. And they constructed a fairy tale world that masked the diverse world outside it. So the White City proclaimed that Chicago was as clean as the East Coast liked to think it was, and it was kind of above the body, and it counted on not really being human or sweaty or mortal. And lower class people were not welcome there. They were basically told to go outside where you had Buffalo Bill's Wild West show and other carnivalesque things on what's now called the Midway, which is in the middle of my university's campus. But fortunately, Chicago's conception of parks and public architecture has changed, and uh, it had better change because we badly need to bring people together in ways that surmount bodily disgust. The city has great problems of both class and, and racial separation. Well, so here's Millennium Park, which opened in 2004. As you approach the park from Michigan Avenue, the shopping street, you first encounter something you don't see up there, which is the, a, a sculpture called the Crown Fountain, designed by the Spanish artist Jaume Plensa. On two huge screens, each of them 50 feet high and about 25 yards apart, you see projected photographs of the faces of Chicagoans of all ages, races, and types. At any given time, there's just one face on this screen and one face on that screen, but they change every five minutes, and while each face is, has its five minutes, they're moving, but in slow motion, with wonderfully comic effect, because these sort of huge faces, it might take a minute for an eyebrow to be raised, and so it's very funny. And every five minutes, just before the two new faces replace the old ones, as if from the mouth of the face, comes this jet of water out. And uh, so, you know, it's sort of like out of the mouth onto the waiting bodies of delighted children. That's what they expected. But now we also find that everyone wants to be there and they're waiting for it and they're joined by parents, grandparents. And getting wet makes people look silly, lose their dignity, people love it, but it has an important symbolism in American history because sharing water with people of different races used to be one of the most terribly feared things in American disgust mythology. So public swimming pools, public drinking fountains were strictly segregated. I think because water represented sexuality and there was this terrible fear of sexual mingling. But in any case, af even after mandatory integration, some southern states preferred to close all the swimming pools rather than to integrate them. So it was a very deep thing. And so to get people to share water together is, is a really, really important thing. And I think it's important in gender terms too because it assails the stigma attached to women's bodies that are often seen as vehicles of the bodily fluids more than the men's bodies. And with these comic ejaculatory bursts of liquid, it says no to laws against interracial sexuality and to Puritanism more generally. As Walt Whitman said in a part of his song of myself, when he's imagining a woman fro who frolics in fantasy with some men who are swimming, she says, he, he writes, they do not think whom they souse with their spray. Well, that's really what Jaume Plensa's Crown Fountain does. Now, if you watch all this from a certain angle, you then see, I mean, there, there are three parts, and this, I'm gonna get to part three. The, you see the sprouting plumes of a band shell designed by Frank Gehry curling upward. It's the band shell designed by Gehry is a silver helmet but it lies on its side. It's like a relic of war that's decided to abandon aggression and sprout plumes and turn into a bird. It's very magical. It's a beautifully curved shape. And it recalls, in a way, 
the lost aspiration to martial glory, but it also takes it apart and turns it peaceful and graceful. So you sit there listening to free concerts and you're in a, a kind of space of peace. But now, when you walk uphill behind the crown fountain, you get to this. This is an enormous st stainless steel statue. So, so what you're seeing there are reflections in the polished stainless steel. It's a sculpture by Anish Kapoor, which is in the shape of an inverted kidney bean, and it is called Cloud Gate, but everyone calls it the bean. So you see that it really is um, a very beautiful shape. You can't, can't really see the kidney bean shape so well in that photo, but it is a very beautiful shape, and it's kept very, very polished. A large group of people are occupied in polishing it every day. And uh, so you, you do see images of sublime beauty as there. The, these are the buildings of Michigan Avenue. But notice, you see them, and they are very beautiful, but they're also slightly comic because they're represented curved and bent in a slightly strange way. Uh, and so too, people. Now that photo shows you just the cleaning crew, but really at any normal time, there are crowds all around it. They're on the side, they're underneath, they're looking up and they're taking photos. It's like a funhouse mirror. You see your own body reflected with a comical shape. And so it's um, a kind of cousin of Maya Lin's Vietnam Veterans Memorial in its emphasis on self-awareness. Both are, reflect the spectator's face and body, both are in the, some sense about the spectator, but of course in this case it's about delight and how odd and funny the shapes of the human body are. And then linking all the parts of this is a bridge that was built by Gary, which is a curving bridge that really doesn't go anywhere, where people just wander and they stop and they talk to each other. So the, this interactive public space celebrates diversity together with the contemplation of beauty and both together with the pleasures of the fun and comedy of the body as young and old paddle in the little pool or get sprayed with the water or, or stare at the reflected clouds. Now what attitudes and sentiments are constructed by this magical place? Well, certainly a love of diversity in one's fellow citizens and a sense that diversity is a source of pleasure and not anxiety. Then too, so important, a delight in getting wet because one of the features least anticipated even by the designers was the extent to which everyone wants to paddle around and use the, the water together. Uh, also, not insignificantly, I think an Aristophanic sense of the ridiculousness of oneself and others, a sense that when the body looks odd and funny or when fluids suddenly shoot out from some part of it, that's delightful rather than alarming. But also mixed with that and not insignificantly, a kind of calmness, a kind of willingness to lie around, to walk slowly, to pause and greet people you never met before. Well, all nations face tragedies that call upon a spirit of extended compassion and the need to surmount self-interest. All nations struggle with a disgust that stigmatizes and excludes. Pondering the work of tragic and comic festivals, we can see a wide range of diverse experiments that make those ideas real in modern times. In all my cases, but of course in the book there are an awful lot more and with more different emotions involved, we see that a poetic spirit, sometimes aspirational, sometimes playful, sometimes both, is required if problems of division and selfishness and suspicion are to be addressed. Sometimes this poetic element takes the form of stirring political rhetoric, as it did with a lot of the great figures I study, from Gandhi and Nehru to Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King Jr. Sometimes, however, it takes the form of an imagined place, a garden of delight, where people come together through enjoyment of the body and its celerity. It will be said, and it always is said, that the demand for love among citizens is too tall an order and that it's unrealistic given the present state of politics in more or less every country. But think what this objection really says. The objector presumably thinks that nations need 
carefully planned technical calculation, economic thought, military thought, good use of computer science and technology. So nations need these things, but they don't need fellow feeling, they don't need the heart, they need expertise, but they don't need the sort of daily emotion, the sympathy, tears, and laughter that we require of ourselves and cultivate in ourselves as parents, as lovers, as friends, or the wonder with which we contemplate the beauty of nature. If that's all that nations are, one might well want to live elsewhere. <laughs> Speaking of his imagined republic, as yet not fully realized, the poet Walt Whitman said, America is you and me. So what I'm really saying is that we should aspire to think and to be nothing less. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think the applause said it all. Wow, that was a lot of food for thought. Let me try to find an entrance. Um, somewhere in the beginning of the book, page 17, you um, explain that you chose the nation as the primary unit of analysis, as the fulcrum in the context in which you elaborate your theory on political emotions. Now, I'm going to ask you why, because obviously here, and specifically in Belgium as well, nation, nationalism is quite a um, contentious uh, concept. So why did you choose the nation as opposed to the global context or the city, for example? Well, I think, of course, a lot of these things are. Is this on? I, I think it is. Is it? Um, are best realized in a more local context like a city. I mean, and so some of my examples are that. But they pertain to values that are shared by the nation. So why did I choose the nation? No, I think it's really for the reasons given by Mazzini. That is to say, if we try to think about humanity, it's too abstract, too distant too hard to make real to ourselves. So although I, like Mazzini, am deeply interested in global justice, I think we have to approach it through the nation as a crucial site of emotional formation because the nation has a kind of concreteness, a historical reality, a vividness that we can hook our minds onto. And the, the, the whole world really doesn't. So, so that's the first point. In Mazzini said the nation is a kind of fulcrum on which you can leverage support for the whole world. And of course, I'm interested in a kind of national a conception of the nation that is continuous with the con concern for the whole world. Because I think if you have the values that I start from, that is that all human beings need a decent level of material support and respect for their equality, then you will naturally want to support that also for the world. But now, here's the second point, which is that I think actually Grotius in the 17th century already was deeply right when he said that the nation has a moral importance because it embodies, it's the vehicle for people's autonomy. That is to say, quite literally, their need to give themselves laws of their own choosing. The nation to this date is the largest unit that we know politically that is decently accountable to people and a, a vehicle for their desire to give themselves laws. Now the EU may at some point become, ha have a higher degree of institutional structure and political accountability, but I think right now 
it's fair to say it, it doesn't have enough. And if it did ever have that, it would probably be more like a federated nation like the US or India, which after all, I mean, India has 22 official languages. It has an immense historical diversity. So, so I'm not saying anything has to be small or homogeneous. And my two cases are cases where there is a federation with a great deal of lo local devolu de devolution and local autonomy. But I do think the nation is the place where we, we know what our constitutional values are, we know what we've committed ourselves to, what we're striving for, and then we try to make that real. Should there ever be a world state? I actually don't think there even should be because I can't imagine that in this world with all of its diversity and all of its misunderstandings, there would ever be a nation-like structure, a state-like structure, that would be decently accountable to the diversity of the world's people. I, I've worked for many years in the UN, as the rector mentioned, and I guess I have a skeptical view of world enterprises from the, I think, gross failures of most parts of the UN, not, not UNICEF and not the UN Development Program, but most agencies of the UN are run by cronyism and they're quite indifferent to uh, serious debate and, and so forth. So, so anyway, we have no reason to be particularly optimistic about a world state and lots of reasons not to be. You, well, Mr. Martyr. <clears throat> I was just Martyr. wondering, you are talking about those two uh, huge democracies, so the United States, India, this is what you're mainly writing about. And well, you're saying we have to, to well, to, to build emotions that support that kind of nations. Now, we are very familiar with that kind of thing mm. uh, in, in Europe, uh, when uh, where nations are built on, let's say, a smaller scale, uh, built on language, on ethnic identity, and so on. My, Mike Burley has written two huge volumes on the, the way in which uh, promoting uh, a secular religion oriented toward the states, how this leads to more segregation, to more projective disgust, to persecution of the Jews, to persecution of the black, etc. Isn't it very risky to, uh, to try to mobilize all kinds of, well, you say patriotic feelings, but uh, nationalistic feelings in, uh, let, let's say, in, in contexts where, where individual states, in fact, uh, are opposed, opposed to one another? Well, I, you know, anything can be used badly. And I'm talking about, I'm stipulating that the values we're trying to protect and promote are good values. And so the fact that sometimes emotions are deployed for bad ends is no surprise to me. Uh, it's the other side that I want to look at. If you have good ends, can you get there and sustain them without the emotions? Now imagine if Martin Luther King Jr. fighting for racial justice had gotten up on that platform on that hot August day on the mall and said, I believe that all Americans should support racial justice. And that's all he said. Now, we, America would have burned down because race riots were happening all over. He needed to mobilize people and turn them from bitter anger and resentment to a common work toward the achievement of justice. And if you look at how he did that, he used powerfully emotive rhetoric drawn from the Bible, drawn from poetry, and from his own great genius. And he was very self-conscious about how he did it. So too Lincoln, trying to heal America after the Gettysburg War. We know now that he studied all the great funeral orations of antiquity. He very carefully constructed a speech to promote the story, which, you know, it has some historical truth, but it was kind of a lie too. It, namely, that America has always been all about equality, and it's going to be, in the future, committed to equality. And so, you know, to sell people on that, he had to write a very beautiful and brilliant speech. And it was a brilliant speech. At the time, probably no one could hear it because there wasn't any microphone. And, uh, but you know what he was writing for was posterity, and I memorized that like every school child. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal, and so on. I mean, I could recite the whole thing for you because it's not very long. But but the point is, he got people to internalize in their early childhood the sense of America as about equality. He could not have done that without rhetoric. And you know, why should one be ashamed of that? 
the, just the fact that somebody could use rhetoric for hatred mean you shouldn't use it for love? I don't see why. It is a non sequitur to me. Couldn't one just say that uh, the Americans were, were lucky to have leaders like that? Because, well, if you get, well, look at Ferguson. Uh, uh, they're marching uh, uh, today in Washington tonight. Um, well, they're following King's nonviolent uh, protest for the most part. And of course, to construct a nonviolent protest movement takes a lot of thought, but it also takes the willingness to use media and means that are popular and that are highly emotive and not be afraid of that. I mean, again, I'll take Nelson Mandela as an example. Mm. Uh, because I'm thinking about him now on the anniversary of his death. If he had stayed away from public emotion, well, you know, there were deep divisions in that country. People hated each other. So how do you get them over that? He turned to many things. He turned to music. He turned to rhetoric. But he powerfully turned to sports, as you may know from the movie mm -hmm. Invictus, which is very, a wonderful movie. Sports are really deeply emotive for most people. And so, you know, he wasn't going to turn to high art. He was going to turn to something that gets people in their gut and makes them very powerfully move. But he was going to use the sport as a vehicle for human interaction and equality. Mm -hmm. And he did. Now, of course, you have to have good politicians. But you don't, I mean, again, getting good politicians and having good political principles are interrelated. If you had terrible political principles, it would attract the wrong sort of politicians. And, you know, of course, we always need better politicians. And yes, uh, India was quite lucky that Gandhi and Nehru were there and that Gandhi had the kind of charisma that could inspire not just Nehru and, I mean, getting these upper class Indians to perform with their body tasks that they found disgusting, like cleaning a latrine or washing dishes, that was required tremendous persuasive power. And then he also had to theatricalize it for the whole world, yeah. So he was a, an enormous genius of the heart and it was a good thing that he was there. But, um, you know, in every time, there are different ways of addressing these problems. And I think you don't always need a huge genius. We're lucky when we have them. But we also need just artists who are great artists and who can be put to work through, let's say, a public refereed competition to construct a, a work that moves people. Maya Lin is not a brilliant politician. She never will be. She just happens to be a brilliant artist. And so there are many different ways to approach these problems. And I think we just use the ones we, we have. Mm -hmm. You use the image of an invitation, people being invited to take part in this liberal society. And you stress the fact that it, the ideas and the love shouldn't be coerced or shouldn't be uh, demanded of people. Um, can you then, um, can, can you in that context actually uh, put forward conditions on the invitation? I mean, if you are hosting a dinner party, can you expect people to, to behave well at least? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you, you can demand civility. Yeah, it's very tricky, of course, because when does the aspiration to civility become an unjustifiable infringement of the freedom of speech. And on a campus, we struggle with that all the time. And anyone who teaches a multiracial, multigender class has to think, what forms of speech will I encourage and what ones will I try to discourage? Now, I guess one, what I would say as the rule of thumb is, you should encourage the widest possible disagreement and dissent, part, partly by who you hire and how you put them in the classroom, uh, compatibly with a kind of respect for opposing positions and uh, allowing them to speak. I mean, for example, last year in our law school, we, it's very hard to find conservative academics. It's really kind of interesting because I think um, the American right is pretty anti-intellectual, and so most leading conservatives are not academics, but we look for that because we want a wide space of debate. And uh, so we hired this very brilliant young conservative, but now next year I've asked him, will he teach a course with me on 
public moralism and legal conservatism, where we're going to look at conservative thought about things like drug laws, alcohol, sex laws, and so on. the whole debate that's unfolded since the 19th century and with James Fitz, James Stephen, and then Lord Devlin, and so on, about whether laws that express public morality are a good idea or whether they're an unjustifiable infringement of liberty. Well, I mean, he knows I'm on the mill side. I think he doesn't know quite which side he's on, but in any case, he wrote me an You're email at 11 o'clock one night saying, is it all right if we don't disagree all the time? So, um, but you know, what I want is not just the disagreement, which we'll learn from, but I want the students to see the disagreement and to see that there can be vigorous disagreement compatibly with mutual respect. So I think that means you don't hire somebody who's not going to, who's going to be rude and racist and so on. And I mean, I have a colleague, another conservative, we have two conservatives out of 35, so it's not very many. But the other one, I was giving a paper about same-sex marriage to our faculty workshop and he made some really strong objections and I was so glad because, you know, you don't want to give a paper for some people who just agree with everything you say. Um, but then afterwards he wrote and he said, I hope that you feel that the way I expressed my objections was respectful. And I did. I had felt that. But I was glad that he asked that question also. And, yeah, so that's what we want to promote. Now, I think what that means is some people are going to be offended anyway. And in American history, patriotism has caused some very bitter divisions. One thing I talk about in the book was the case just before the, we got into the Second World War. So 1939, there was a law in one state that every day children had to salute the American flag. It was required by law. And a minority religion, the Jehovah's Witnesses, were not willing to do that because they think the flag salute is idolatrous because you're showing reverence to a physical object. So they just asked to be excused from that. Now, today, that would be a no-brainer. It would be just the most obvious case of something where the First Amendment freedom of religion gives you the right to be absent from that. But in those days, that was not the case, and the Supreme Court said they ruled against the children, and Justice Frankfurter, the only Jewish justice on the Supreme Court, felt very strongly about it because he felt that somehow our values were in peril and saluting the flag was what we had to do. But he was wrong, you know, and pretty soon everyone realized that that was wrong, that you don't support American values by silencing dissent, and especially when it's somebody's deep religious conviction. So anyhow, it's a delicate balance, but the self-correcting nature of this, I think, is very important, that the minute there's too much suppressing of dissent, people need to speak up and say this is bad, and then four years later the Supreme Court did reverse itself. Would that also apply to, for example, someone who for religious reason doesn't want to shake hands with a woman? Yeah, I mean, why should they have to shake hands? Actually, to tell you the truth, I am carrying on a campaign to substitute namaste for all handshaking because it's the most great source of disease in society. <laughs> I mean, I went to have a checkup at a dermatologist, and the nurse came in, and this is in a hospital setting where most germs are transmitted, I'm afraid, and she comes in and she shakes my hand. And I said, I hope you don't mind if I wash my hands now. And she said, well, you're quite right, because I had been with lots of different patients and I had not washed my hands. We know from studies that doctors don't wash their hands. Mm -hmm. So I think anyone who shakes hands is... Uh, is well advised not to do so in general. But anyway, <laughs> sir, sure, I mean, if it's for a religious reason, that's, uh, that's all the better. Just one more uh, question on this, on this point. You mentioned in the book also that um, to, to, to be able to form this community, language is one of the prerequisites. Could you then um, imagine it being a requirement, a condition, to um, adhere to this group? I mean, could a, a society say, we need you to learn the language in order to be allowed to belong to our society? Well, you know, I think it's, you have to take this case by case. Now, if in the case of the US, where there was such a, a overwhelming majority who are Anglophone, it made sense not to go very far in the direction of bilingualness, although now, since there's an increasing proportion who are Spanish-speaking, then I think bilingual education, particularly in those states, 
is a good idea. Uh, and actually, you find that what really immigrants want is bilingual. They don't want to not speak English. In fact, in a study of my capabilities approach that two social scientists did, they found that the thing that I had left off my list that ought to be on it is, and they, the study was done with new immigrants in a variety of countries, was the ability to function in the dominant language of the country you're in. So that, that people usually want that because it's a key to employment. I think if you're India, it makes, of course, no one ever dream that you're gonna require one language. You have 22 that are official, 350 that are really spoken. So what do you do? Now, people in, initially, they didn't really want English to be the language because that was the British, the language of the Raj, but it's happened that way and it's not so bad because it is a lingua franca that connects people and making Hindi the dominant language wouldn't be quite fair to the people from the South whose language is totally non-Indo-European. The national anthem is an interesting case because Tagore spoke Bengali and that's family related to Hindi and Gujarati and Punjabi and uh, Marathi, but it's not, they're not mutually intelligible. They're just all descended from Sanskrit. But of course, they're not even at all related to the Dravidian languages of the South. So he wrote it in a kind of highly Sanskritized Bengali, so it would be more intelligible to the speakers of the other languages descended from Sanskrit, but it doesn't solve the problem, really. So people just have to know what it means, and they do. And what it means is, we come together from the Punjab, from the South, and I mean, so it lists all the different regions of India, and then in the second stanza, all the different religions of India, and we all alike owe reverence to the law. So it's interesting. He put the plurality into the content. It was he couldn't do it entirely into the language. South Africa, they actually did it in the language. You know, the, lang the national anthem of South Africa uses five languages. Three African languages in the first part, which is a version of the freedom anthem, Nkosi Sikalele Africa. Then there's a part that was the old Afrikaner hymn, De Stem. And then the last bit is in English. So that, you know, that worked for them. Well, just a while ago, we were at uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and at, uh, at the Muslims. <coughs> now you are always at the, the right side, which, which is the left side. But, um, well, you, you're, there's, there's a matter regarding headscarves and the burqa, which is uh, deeply dividing uh, the European left, let's say. And writing about the Swiss minaret decision or the German uh, ban on, on headscarves by uh, public uh, school teachers, you wrote the following. I quote, Europe urgently needs to engage in a deep and searching debate about equality and what equal respect for citizens entails in the area of religion. Could you explain that? A bit, yeah, well, I mean, just to go back for a minute to your point about nationalism, I think Europe has the following problem, that most European nations have been heavily influenced by a romantic conception of the nation, which is based in ethnicity and religion and blood and soil and so on. So unlike India and the US, which have always had a political conception of nationhood and national unity, it's much harder to see immigrants as real, whatever, real Swiss, real Belgians and so on. And I think people at a reflex level still view them as foreign even if they're citizens and they've been around for a very long time. So what's ultimately needed is a lot more work and work from childhood up on a new conception of national identity that is multi-religious, that is multi-racial and so on. And you know, I find that even though all European nations have had difference for a long time, I mean, except when the Jews were turned out, they were always there, and yet they don't really acknowledge that. Uh, so about hanging a crucifix in an Italian public school classroom, my um, own friends who are, you know, thinking of themselves as Italian liberals say, oh, well, but this is so new to us. And I say, don't, don't you think it expresses disrespect that children who are Muslim or Jewish or whatever have to have a crucifix in front of the classroom? In a, in a public school. And, uh, and they say, oh, well, this is so new to us, you know, we've never really thought about this before. But of course, I mean, the Jews were there all along, you know, and they could have thought about that earlier, but they really thought that the Jews should behave like everyone else and kind of disappear into Italianness in order to have full civil rights. So um, luckily, 
not because of any virtue, but because of history, the US has never had that problem because we're a nation of weirdos and dissidents who fled from every other place and came with weird customs and Quakers with their tall hats and they refused to take off their hat in court and Jews wouldn't come to court on a Saturday and so on. And so uh, people quickly understood that we have to be live together or, or sink apart. And, oh. and so they got these notions of accommodation of religious difference, and those were really pretty firmly entrenched by independence. And at independence, only 17% of Americans were members of any established church. They were all these dissident types of Protestants who were seekers of this and that. And um, so, you know, that's our good luck. But I think all modern nations are more like that now. Because after all, with the graying of the population and the dwindling re reproduction rate, all nations need immigrants. And they're, it's like inviting guests to your house and then treating them really rudely. So, uh, you know, you don't invite guests to your house and then just say, well, you know, if you want to be at this dinner party, you have to speak exactly like me and dress exactly like me when you've invited people from that very different country to your house. So I think you really have to think about that. But in the area of religion, it seems to me particularly urgent because um, difference in dress, difference in custom, difference in behavior, I think is all fine if it doesn't subvert peace and safety. <clears throat> but certainly if it's regarded by people as mandated by their religion, then it's all the more important. And I mean, think about those Quakers who refused to take off their hat in court. Well, th that seemed to people very shocking, very disrespectful, but they soon thought, oh well, that's their religion, they're not bothering anyone, so we build that in. And then they had Catholics and the priest refused to testify in a criminal case about what he learned under the seal of the confessional. And, these mostly Protestant Americans thought that was very weird and very objectionable. But then they said, well, you know, it's their religion and the sacrament of the confessional does appear to depend upon that. <laughs> and so then they just let that go too. So I think just thinking about the history of countries that have had much greater religious plurality for a much longer time, uh, Europe uh, will probably come up with these policies sooner or, or later. But I think it's something that, it, it, would be good for children to learn that early. And, um, you know, we have, every child memorizes these poems, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. So we learn it's a nation of immigrants. And it would be good for Europe to come to see itself as a nation of immigrants, because it actually is. You're a firm believer of, of uh, the fact that it's possible to learn to feel appropriately, is what you write education, through arts as well. Yeah. Um, we're used to learning facts and figures, not so much how to feel until well, now. Well, look, um, I think we do learn to feel. Parents teach children that um, they, they lead them into love, into gratitude. They also teach them whom to fear, when they should fear. They have to, of course. I mean, with, in this world, there's a lot to be afraid of and to learn whom you should fear and when you should fear is very important. So parents are all the time teaching their children how and when to feel. And if they see their child behaving in an overly aggressive way, they would say, you know, you, you shouldn't really hate him. Think, think about what Johnny is really feeling now and, and try to understand it from his viewpoint. So parents are working on their children's feelings all the time and I think we do. How do people learn, let's say, sentiments of equal respect and fellow feeling across racial barriers? Well, sometimes they learn it, if they're lucky enough, by having friends who are interracial from different races. And that has happened to a great extent, I think, with gays and lesbians, because it does happen that they are everywhere, and they're in everyone's family, and no matter whether you're middle class or poor, somebody's child in your neighborhood is gay or lesbian, so you get to know them. But that's not true with race in America. So I grew up, um, the only African American that I ever saw on a daily basis was the child of live-in servants in my neighborhood. Uh, and I did actually play with her and then my father got very upset about that and so on. So 
well, from my father, I certainly was not, I was learning suspicion, fear, and even disgust, because he did believe that African Americans contaminated things they touched. I mean, he was a, a very cultivated man, but he had these irrational beliefs because he grew up in the Deep South. So, how did I learn that? Well, I had to learn from the Civil Rights Movement, really, and then later by meeting people, of course, but I learned from the rhetoric of Martin Luther King and from other things like that, and now, I'm glad to say, little children have many opportunities. So in a school classroom, they will act out a play of the, the segregated buses, and somebody will play, a white girl might play the part of Rosa Parks, who's told, go to the back of the bus, and she refuses to go. And with her own body, she learns what it feels like to be stigmatized and excluded. They also will take all those school children to see 12 Years a Slave and understand the powerful emotions of that film and now the new movie about Martin Luther King Jr., which is supposed to be wonderful and it hasn't opened yet in Chicago, but I'm gonna see it soon. And so, you know, there are all kinds of ways that the arts give you a, an emotional education, you learn how to feel. And, and uh, of course, if there were a film, as there have been, that dignified Nazism, I mean, Lena Wertmuller's films, for example, those would be not, parents wouldn't take the whole school class to see that with great enthusiasm. If you study that in Germany, you couldn't even view such, such works at all. In America, you can, but if you taught such a work, you would teach it in a highly critical way with highly contextualized uh, discussion of what function that work uh, played. But as young children, we, we don't have that kind of critical capacity. So we internalize the things we see, and therefore parents are rightly selective about what their children see. Shall we um, open up the discussion yeah. on the floor? Is there any because way of having any light in the floor? I'm sure because I, I'd like to be able to relate to people. Ah, great. Ah, nice Wonderful. to meet you. <laughs> OK, there are walking microphones, or rather people with microphones in their hands, going around. Now, any hands up already? It's always an awkward moment. Someone has to bite the bullet first, but I'm sure you're brimming with questions. Anyone? Shout yes. out. Ah, okay, over Hi. there. Please do tell us who you are and um, what your question is. Put forward your question. Is this, is this me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, Hi, I'm not sure which question to ask yet. I have a million. Stand up, because then I can see Here which one is asking. Oh, it's right in the back? Okay. Yeah, yeah I'm in the very back. Okay. Um, my name is Kathleen, and um, I have a million questions. Um, you, you can have one now. And there I'm are very, more and, people. <laughs> and I'm very pressed to ask a good one, because everybody's looking at me. But um, I have a lot of questions about education and about children. I also, um, and what we can do as parents, I also have a lot of questions about disability because that's the field I'm working in. Um, but I'll just ask you some other question, which is how did Roosevelt come up with this great idea of using art and photography um, to create a kind of compassion that instills you know, generosity and, and makes people want to be publicly mm. involved? Well, how Roosevelt, did he come up with that? Roosevelt was a very thoughtful politician. And he all the time thought about how to use radio, how to use his public speeches. And, and so the first thing to say is, like Lincoln, he was a very thoughtful person who didn't do anything by accident. But then, because it was the Depression, he had already created the, what was called the WPA, which put to work artists on lots of public projects. And so he had this whole bunch of very fine artists who were, you know, unemployed because of the Depression, and he had given them jobs, I mean, doing things like decorating public buildings and so on. But now there's this new idea. There's a wonderful book about the whole thing, which you could read to get the whole story, called The Sympathetic State by Michelle Landis Dauber, D-A-U-B-E-R. She's a student of mine who wrote a dissertation with me on this topic. And uh, so anyhow, I really recommend that. And he did this with other media too. He was close to John Steinbeck and the novel The Grapes of Wrath was closely connected to his efforts as well. <coughs> Thank you for the question. Who's next? 
There's a microphone walking over there and over there. Who's first? Yes, do speak. Yeah. Um, yes, um, my name is uh, Julie Kuhn. I'm a lecturer in ethics and gender studies, and I'm quite familiar with, uh, with your work. Can and you I put up the microphone a bit yes, closer? Yes, yes. Right, so we can hear you exactly. properly. Okay. Thank you. I have also many, many questions, and I would like to thank uh, Professor Nussbaum for the very inspiring lecture. It's, uh, it's amazing uh, what we had to, uh, this evening. But I have one uh, pressing question. I wrote your last book, uh, I read your last book, and sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what a lapsus. <laughs> by, yeah. by last one, which, which one do you well, mean? This one, the, this one. Th this yeah. new one. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, it's, fun. It's, it's very inspiring and there's so many ideas and you spoke about it. But I just had one uh, pressing question because also students asked me about it. At the end of the, the book and also in your lecture, you're always referring to male examples, ideals, like uh, Lincoln, Roosevelt, Handy, uh, yeah. Nehru. Um, so I know you are sensitive to gender issues. Yeah. Uh, so well, good. Okay, so I, yeah. get, the, I get the point. <laughs> yeah, now, get the, the point. first thing to say is that all through the book, the emphasis <laughs> is on a kind of gender ambig ambiguous norm which is exemplified for me uh, as the first chapter is a reading of Le Noce di Figaro in the persona of Carabino, who is male but has female qualities because he's been brought up to love poetry and the arts and so on. So I talk a lot about gender in that chapter and I say that what really needs to happen is you can't change the domineering and hierarchical nature of the ancien regime simply by putting new men in power. But you have to have a different kind of human being, one who is as much female as male, or where, where the traditional female virtues of reciprocity, sympathy, and playfulness come into focus. In the chapter on Tagore, I lay great emphasis on the way he empowered women through the dance and how he, one of his central projects was indeed to use the body to create agency in women who had previously been ashamed of their bodies. So, you know, there's a lot of female examples in the book and Amita Sen is, is really central. In American political life, as also in Indian political life, there have not been so very many leaders who have been female. That must change, and it is changing. And so a book that would be written 25 years from now would be a different book, I, I believe. But the artists are certainly female as well as male. I mean, look at Maya Lin, for example, who's probably the central artistic figure in the book. And I also, in the chapter on patriotism, I lay great emphasis on the fact that as a child of six, I was reading a book about a, an enterprising 15-year-old girl who rode a very dangerous ride to warn the American Revolutionary Army that the British were coming. And this is a real historical case. But what was significant was that it was known to me at the age of six in a children's magazine that my parents had subscribed to for me. And so, well, that was pretty lucky because there weren't too many things at that time that, that made female heroes real from history, but that one did. So, so you know, I feel we need a lot more things like that and uh, in literature for children and in the arts. And I do think that the arts are an extremely powerful figure of not just gender norms, but norms of sexual orientation and transgender and so on. And, you know, and I've written a lot about that elsewhere. But when you come, when it comes to political leaders, we're stuck with what we've got historically. And that is, fortunately, men who do have a kind of uh, gender ambivalence. I think Lincoln was always viewed as a strangely unmanly man because he was so reflective and slightly in, in, inward and not aggressive. And Roosevelt too, you know, he was kind of cheerful, frivolous, uh, a little bit playful. And, and, and so they're men who are, you know, don't fit the stereotype of the manly man of the American West. And, I, and Gandhi, most of all, I mean, everyone who met Gandhi said he was maternal. That's the way they described him. And he deliberately cultivated androgyny in his persona. And he believed the traditional masculinity was entirely bad. Now, I think he, his critique of gender and sexuality was a, a little bit off for me because he thought that 
male sexuality was only about making demands on women and that women all wanted celibacy and so So anyway, there was something off about his idea about women, I think. Margaret Sanger, the great contraception ad advocate when she met Gandhi, said that he understood nothing about women. But he did certainly want to deconstruct gender or gender binaries and to represent himself as androgynous. And so too, to a certain degree, the people around him. I mean, I don't know how much you know about India, but traditional in images of the male in India are very androgynous. Krishna is dis depicted as very sensuous, very unaggressive. He lounges around with the gopis and so on. And the Hindu rite has great trouble with those aspects of traditional Indian mythology. So they're always trying to object to scholars who emphasize it, and they've even banned books on that account. But in any case, it's there in the tradition. So Gandhi was able to represent himself as androgynous without courting political difficulty. That would not have been possible for King. King did not want to represent himself as androgynous, I think, clearly. But in any case, he, he couldn't have done that had he uh, tried to do that. But there are ways of being less aggressive. And certainly, some of the men in my, in my book did find them. Thank you. We have time for a couple more. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you, Professor Nussbaum, for the very interesting lecture. It was wonderful. My name is Sarah Kozmans. I'm an historian. <coughs> and I have a question to, I want to return to Annelise Beck's point in the beginning about nationalism. Because you might be well aware that in Belgium, nationalism is actually a very complicated issue. And yeah. it's not the continuity that you speak about as an historian, um, having studied a bit about nationalism. Um, you see that the changing discourse of nationalism changes the boundaries of who belongs in it and who yeah. doesn't. Um, on a grander scale, European nationalism is very deeply shaped by divisions and um, notions of colonialism and signs of race and all these things. Well, now that you present your book here and you give this wonderful example of um, the city shape of Chicago, I wonder if cities or communities are not a better um, category of analysis than the very uh, contentious nation. Thank you. Well, thanks, yeah. I guess the first thing about nationalism, my view in the book, is that any concept of the nation is a construct. And it's certainly based on history, but it's got to be highly selective. And it creates a narrative out of materials which are just lying around. And uh, when Lincoln said that America was uh, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal, he sort of left out the Constitution, which made slavery legal. And so, you know, he was putting some things forward and leaving other things shockingly out. Um, so any story of the nation does that. And some <clears throat> are radical and radically revisionary. I think Scottish nationalism is largely a construct, for example, but that doesn't mean that it's not now real and, and motivational for people. So anyway, the, the question about the city. I think, of course, if you're talking about visual art, you've got to work on a, in, in, in a way that people can actually come to it. So either your city has to be one that a lot of people visit, and right now we're competing to be the site of the Barack Obama Museum and Library, and that will be a very interesting thing. Because part of that is about how can we make it possible for lots of Americans to visit that place and, and be there. And That's one reason it's not going to be in Hawaii, because it's just too expensive to go there. Uh, but anyway, you know, mostly it's going to be seen, as, apart from people who visit, by the people who are there. But that's why we have to rely not only on visual art, but also on the work of political rhetoric and on written texts and teaching in schools, book discussion groups, and many other things. But still, the city depends on the nation's constitution and the things that it makes possible what John Rawls calls the basic structure, that is the institutions that determine people's life chances in a very fundamental way and from the very start of a human life, those are really national institutions. Chicago cannot come up with its own medical insurance scheme. Well, it, I mean, states have done that. Massachusetts actually did that before Obamacare became a reality. Uh, so, you know, states have some power in a federated nation. 
but certainly not cities so much. So one problem for Chicago is it's in a state that because of corruption and lack of good planning is bankrupt and it depends on the state, not just on the city. So we have to deal with first the state, but then the nation is the place where most basic policies are made. That's not true in every area. So in India, for example, they explicitly say that education and health are areas that are dedicated and left for the discretion of the states. That's partly because of linguistic pluralism and so on. So, you know, in certain matters, the state would be the right unit to think about, but at the level of like, what kind of basic values do we have? What are our fundamental rights as citizens? What are our guarantees? What is our social safety net? It really is the nation that is the primary site. So that means that what, wherever our efforts are, they ought to try to allude to those basic values. And of course, a state can lead the way as Massachusetts has led the way in the case of health insurance. But in the end, if it's going to mean anything on a basis of equality for everyone, it's got to be done at the level of the nation. Okay. One last question. I know, I know there are thousands of questions hovering in the yeah, air now still. More and more, yeah. But time is running out, I'm sorry to say. Hello, my name is. Is this on? Yeah. Yes, it's on. Keep it very close to your mouth so okay. we can hear you. I'm an historian too, and I think one of the um, things you hear here is that uh, you use without any separation nation and state uh, in discriminatory. That's something we can't do here. And I'll give you one example. I did some research on this as well. If you look at the political cartoons that have been used to depict nation and state at least over the last two centuries, the nation is always natural. It's a natural image. It's things like a tree, a, uh, an animal, a woman. A state never is in Europe, apparently. Uh, it's a construction, it's a castle, it's a building, it's a wall. So perhaps, as you said before, uh, this is what we're stuck with. This is our political culture, apparently, that we can't uh, connect the two very easily together, and it's certainly not in a country like Belgium. My question is, how do we get past that? Because there's one thing to talk about where it came from or what we have now. You talk about education, you talk about rhetoric, you talk about um, arts. What I don't get in the story is the part of the body. Uh, how are we supposed to use our body to get past uh, into another political culture. Uh, okay, well, first let me just briefly say that I do talk about the relation between nation and state in, in several places in the book. It's a, it's a complicated story because I, I think there is this idea that there is something that's natural. But of course, as Eric Hobsbawm has long said very, very compellingly, the idea of the nation is itself a construct. I mean, even the very idea of its naturalness is constructed because after all, uh, nothing uh, exists from time immemorial and nothing is, is uh, truly uh, natural because people have been moving around and going in, going out. Anyway, so that's a long discussion and I think it's very dangerous to think of a nation as natural and to fail to realize that it's always a work in progress and always a construction that's closely linked to the form of government that it makes available to all people. So anyway, we, th th that's a long discussion, but that's, that's basically what I think. Um, as to the body, well, you know, I, as I say throughout the book, one of the main problems we have to deal with is people's unwillingness to inhabit their own bodies, their unease with their own bodies, their bodily fluids, their uh, mortality, their decay, and so on. Because it's not just a problem for the individual, and it is that as people age, it's gonna be a worse life as you age if you hate the body because you're gonna be more and more <laughs> aware of it. Uh, you can sort of forget it when you're young and healthy, but not as you age. So, um, but it's a social problem because the way that people deal with this unease is to project animality, smell, stickiness, liquid, and so on onto other groups of people. 
and use that to subordinate them and to represent them as animals. We're above all that and they're the animals. And so it's sort of like the way that uh, Gulliver in Jonathan Swift's novel came to view his fellow human beings when he came back to them. Oh, they're those smelly yahoos, those animals, and they're not like him at all, and he couldn't touch them. Well, I think we mostly feel that way about some group of people in our society, or at least a lot of people do, and that's a problem we need to address. So how do we do that? Well, I think it's contextual. I think Tagore was quite right to say that the main site of disgust in the India of his day well, a main site was the female body and that therefore the empowerment of women through dance and through education was a, a, a crucial part of getting over that kind of disgust. Caste-based disgust, he didn't um, say so much about and he was dealing largely with upper caste people in his school, although he himself uh, had no prejudices on caste. But Gandhi figured that one out. You just get people to use their bodies to do all the things that they thought were only for, for the Dalits to do. So he just tells his wife, clean the latrine. If you see Attenborough's movie, you see. Uh, and at first she's disgusted, but soon, because he was very persuasive, people became proud of that. And here's Nehru doing pots, washing pots and pans. That's a thing that only a Dalit would do. Well. Nehru was a Kashmiri Brahmin, the elite of the elite. And then when he's in prison, he's weaving at a spinning wheel. Now, that's women's work, it's lower caste work, it's all those things. So they did it with their own bodies, and that was Gandhi's idea. And, and until you do it with your own body, you won't get over it. Uh, as to racial intermixing, well, I think Millennium Park has one brilliant solution. You get people to go swimming together. You get them to have fun together. Uh, so, you know, there are other things. Now, Chicago Children's Choir, which is very racially mixed. It's about 80% African American, but also mixed by class. The director of that said to me that when people share breath with someone else in the act of singing, that is a very good way of negating racial disgust because it is sharing an intimate part of your body and you're standing right next to somebody and you're actually, you're making the sounds from within your own body but then you're sharing it with the breath of someone else. So, you know, many different uh, ways but they have to be explored. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this wonderful evening. So let's give it up for Martha Nussbaum, thank you very much. Dank u om hier te zijn, kom goed thuis en vergeet niet, mevrouw Noesbaum, tekent nog boeken, signeert nog.